as a prosecutor, and I prosecuted for, for five years, I was a member of the Homicide Squad in this County for four years, and then I went on to the United States Department of Justice where I was the United States Attorney for almost five years. So I have almost 10 years of prosecutorial experience. But I knew as a line prosecutor, as a homicide prosecutor, working for the Department of Justice, when I would speak to police officers, when I would speak to FBI agents, Secret Service agents, agents from the DEA, agents from the state police, state police troopers, and each and every one of them would actually tell me that they fabricated reports to establish probable cause in order to make a search look legal. When they would say, Paul, where do you want me to stand? What do you want me to say when I get on the witness stand? How do we get around this? What do I have to testify to? It really turns you completely sour within the system. But I learned. What I did is I absorbed like a sponge everything that came into my office, every agent, officer, police officer. You get the mindset of a police officer so you know every trick of the trade. You know what they can say, what they can't say. You know when they're telling the truth, you know when they're lying. And you know how to adjust the case as a defense lawyer now, to show and prove that the police are not telling the truth, the whole truth, and not but the truth, so help them God. And I think that's made me a much stronger defense counsel. For individuals in the community, you know that many, many times, loved ones have been stopped, loved ones who have been searched, loved ones who have gone through the system. You look at the police report after your loved one tells you what really happened, and it's completely inconsistent with the truth, with the facts, how they were stopped, how the evidence was got, and exactly what's going on in court. And you say to yourself, I mean, this is a system that's supposed to protect the good, the bad, the strong, the weak, the rich, the poor. And you come to realize that it really doesn't work like that. And it's true, what Mr. Mohammed said, if you don't have a, a good mouthpiece, if you go a lot of times with a public defender or a weak defense lawyer, you're going to end up plea bargaining. You're going to end up taking something that you really don't want to take, or you're going to end up convicted wrongfully because you don't have that person that could pour their heart into the case and that could fight that fight. And what I have to tell each and every one of you is that, first of all, no one, no one could ever be compelled, forced, intimidated, threatened, to talk to the police or give a statement. Many times individuals are questioned, many times they're forced to give statements that aren't the truth because they're worn down. If you think of history, some of the strongest men that have ever served our country, Rangers, Green Beret, when they've been taken prisoners, you wear them down, you beat them enough, you threaten them, you intimidate them, you keep them under strong interrogations for hour after hour after hour, your will becomes overborne, and you say things that you don't mean just to get out of there. You say things to just get away from that particular environment, things that aren't truthful, things that are exaggerated. And the prosecutors that I've seen in my experience, whether you're a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor, they end up using those statements against the person or against the person that they're going to force this individual to testify to. And the law protects that statement because if you then take the witness stand and say, look, that statement that I gave last year, I was forced to give that statement. My will was overborne. I was threatened. I was intimidated. I was questioned for 12 hours. I was told that if I don't give a statement, that is going to take my children away from me. I was told that if I don't say that all the drugs are mine, the guns are mine found in the house, that what's going to happen is they're going to lock up my girlfriend or my mother or my wife and put them in jail and take my children away from me. And what happens is when you say that and you want to tell the truth, your statement that you gave a year ago then comes into evidence to be used against that person you're being forced to testify to or even against yourself. So I've seen the system of injustice, and the most important thing you can take from this meeting is, under no circumstances do you ever have to give a statement, under no circumstances do you ever have to agree to be a witness, nobody could force you, nobody could compel you, the only words out of your mouth should ever be, I want to speak to my lawyer, I want consultation, I want advice, before, during, and after I ever speak to anyone. People think about polygraphs. And a lot of times, the police will say to you, are you willing to take a polygraph? We're going to give you a polygraph right now. But essentially, a polygraph is inadmissible evidence. 
a polygraph can't be admitted. You have to ask yourself, the first question you have to ask yourself is, why can't we admit a polygraph against someone? Because it's scientifically unreliable. Unreliable. It's been tested over and over and over again. The best experts in the world have said that you can beat the machine. The machine isn't accurate. It depends upon who's asking the questions. But not only that, most importantly, it depends upon who's interpreting the results. That's why a polygraph is not admissible, and that's why the police should never be able to threaten anybody into forcing them to take a polygraph as an attempt and a means to give a statement and intimidate an individual. I've seen a lot of injustices from every single angle, whether you've been a, whether, as a prosecutor, whether you're a United States attorney, in the military where I've represented individuals all over the world, in Kuwait, Germany, Iraq. And essentially it always comes down to it always comes down to the job of the law enforcement officer, how they did their job, the fact that in every single society, in every single forum, you have a lot of law enforcement officers that don't play fear. And when they don't play fear, there's evidence that's gotten, there's evidence that's used against individuals, and ends up hurting them. I've seen that repeatedly. I've seen that over and over and over again. Uh, when I've represented individuals on homicides, the police are supposed to search for the truth. They're supposed to look at every single piece of forensic, scientific, and physical evidence. If you sit on a jury, or you sit in the, in the courtroom, and you hear a trial, and you listen to what's presented, they never ever take fingerprints on a gun. They never ever take fiber type evidence. They never ever test the blood that's on the street, the blood that's on clothing. They never ever look for the physical, forensic, or scientific evidence that could prove someone is innocent. I see it repeated, and I've tried 37 murder cases to a jury, and I've had over 150 jury trials worldwide. And repeatedly, and anybody who's ever, ever heard my summations or watched me in trial, or seen me in court cross-examine a police officer, forensic expert, or sum up to a jury, I repeatedly talk about the investigation, the lack of investigation, the evidence, and the lack of evidence. And repeatedly what you get, and you have to be a really an astute attorney, and you don't get that a lot. You don't have a lot of defense lawyers out there now that know how to question people about physical, forensic, and scientific together because they don't understand the theories themselves. But even you as lay individuals, even by just watching TV, whether it be CSI, Law and Order, you pick up a lot. A lot of that's fiction, a lot of that's make-believe, but the theory, what goes on behind it, okay, there's a lot of truth in that. And a lot of times the police could prove that individual did not commit a crime by the use of DNA evidence. And what do you see happening religiously? You see individuals spending 10, 15, 20 years before the article is attested. And then when they test them, they finally see that the individual didn't commit the offense, and they free them. But what happens to the individual? What's, what's, what, a, what, what value does that individual's life has after he's innocently been locked up and caged up like an animal and fought his way through state prison systems for 10, 15, or 20 years? What kind of value does it have? I know each and every one of us take pride in ourselves. We're supposed to enjoy each and every day of our lives. Because each and every day is very, very important. But think about individuals that are incarcerated, that wait a year, 18 months, two years before they come to trial, and they did nothing. They may have been merely present at the scene. Or they're picked up in a suite. Or the police find an object a block away, and they see a group of black kids standing on the corner, and they say, you know, each and every one of you, whose is it? If you don't tell me now whose it is, you're all going to wear it. Well, how many times have your children, your loved ones, your friends been stopped in an automobile? There's one gun found under the seat. Your friend, your family, your loved one has absolutely no idea what's inside that car, what's in the trunk of a car, what's underneath the seat of a car. Yet everybody in that car is arrested and everybody's charged with the exact same thing, what's inside that car, although you have no knowledge. And it takes you a year or two years to get to trial. And your bail is set so high because we live in a disproportionate system where the rich could bail out like that. Like that. The kids in the seat and all fire, multi-millionaire kids. Okay, bail set at a million dollars. Okay, how many of us, or how many kids that grew up with us, could have actually, they would have been sitting in jail for two, three, four years before their case goes to trial. 
So I see these injustices every single day, and it, it really drives me to be a better lawyer, a better person, and a better advocate. And that's all I ask each and every one of you. If you ever sit on a jury, if you ever watch a case, if you ever have an opportunity to speak to other individuals, you let them know that we live in a system where people are treated differently. No matter which way you cut it, no matter how you try to change it. And the only way to change it, the only way to fight it, is by pouring your entire body, heart, and soul into each and every case. And that's what I attempt to do.